A lot of predictions are net positive, but there's a time issue, right? Uh, a worker being out of work mm. for six months or a year is a significant impact on somebody's life. Yeah. Um, so it raises a lot of questions. <laughs> Hello everyone. I hope you're all staying very well wherever you are listening in. This week we've got our latest episode of the Voctech podcast, Learning Continued, which seeks to explore the intersection of adult learning and tech. In conversation are an insight and data specialist on the new economy, an investor in vocational learning technology, and an expert in supporting executive leadership and teams development. In true podcast fashion, there are tea slurps, baby cries and computer dings in amongst the gems about specific training to working online, more creative online working tools and supporting employees' well-being with all the change hitting us at present. This episode is about building back better and takes its starting point from a World Economic Forum article on five ways to reset labour markets after coronavirus recovery, which you can find shared on our show notes page. But before all that, a few messages from our friends in the community. First up, Victoria at Wise talks about their upcoming event. On June 23rd, Wise will host a three-day online global gathering, Education Disrupted, Education Reimagined. Discussions will unpack how education systems across the world have responded to the pandemic. The first day, from rapid response to future preparation, will consider how we best measure the effectiveness of different responses to the crisis, followed by leveraging innovation to reimagine resilience on June 24th, which will look at how we can best future-proof education ecosystems. And finally, on June 25th, redefining equity through technology, we'll examine how the current crisis has accelerated cross-sector collaborations and underline the need to bridge deep digital divides. Some of the notable names you can expect to hear from include Patrick Brothers and Maria Spies, co-founders of Holland IQ, Mike Fierick, founder of Allison, and Amira Yahawi, CEO and co-founder of Moss.com. For more information on the program and how to register, please visit our website at www.wise qatar.org. We hope to see you there. And now, here's Jenna Ash, editor at Education Technology. Hey there, EdTech folks. My name is Jenna Ash, and I'm the editor of Education Technology, part of EdQuarter, a cross education learning platform for the schools and higher education sector. On the 25th of June, we're hosting a free digital event packed full of EdTech experts and thought leaders to help you plan for the future of education. EdQuarter presents the EdTech Sofa Sessions. We'll bring you six hours of exciting webinar discussions and one-to-one interviews with pioneering leaders of the sector. Hot topics of discussion include remote learning, the digital divide, student recruitment and female representation in tech. Join us from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. or drop in for a session or two. On top of hearing from some of the industry's most influential figures, such as Laura McEnany of TeacherTap, Abdul Chohan of Think Simple Limited, Kimberly Bryant of Black Girls Code, and many more, you'll receive a free copy of our exclusive report, COVID-19, How the Pandemic is Affecting Teaching. This is an event you won't want to miss. So visit edtechnology.co.uk slash 2020 event. That's edtechnology.co.uk slash 2020 event to bag your free ticket today. We can't wait to see you there. Thanks, Victoria and Jenna. Right, that's all for now. Have a great week. And if you enjoy this episode, feel free to rate and review us wherever you listen. OK, let's go. Brilliant. So uh, we've got to another Friday, lockdown Friday, and, you know, we've survived again. Um, and I'm really delighted to uh, be here with a selection of super interesting people to talk about uh, future of work and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on everything that's happening at the moment. Um, so rather than me kind of... Uh, uh, blustered my way through some some long biographies. I thought perhaps we could start by everyone just sort of introducing themselves and talking about what things have been the most impactful over the last four months. Who'd like to go first? 
I'll go first. I don't mind. The, um, I'm Gordon Bateman. I founded a company called CRSI, which is around the development of high-performing teams for small, high-growth businesses, 90% of which are venture capital or private equity-backed um, in the science and technology arena, so very much around the people side of growing businesses. Um, the last 12 weeks, or however long it is since we've been in lockdown, have flown by um in different phases across mm. the across the, the time um and that has been um, quite interesting to see so we've had quite a good cross section of feelings emotions um and comments from chief execs and investors from a range of different vertical markets of how they've been evolving and developing through this time of a rapid change i guess really Great, thank you. Um, Vessi, do you want to go next? Certainly, thank you, Sophie. Um, my name is Veselina Yachina. I work at the World Economic Forum, and in particular in our team um, focused on the social and economic agenda. So we've been tracking for a number of years the ways in which jobs and skills are changing, and they had already been changing quite significantly up to now uh, because of the absorption of new technologies, because our world changes daily, uh, sometimes faster and sometimes slower. Uh, and what we had been trying to do for those years is also set out an agenda for action together with the leaders who take part in um, our communities, in the World Economic Forum, so with both governments and in a lot of cases businesses for what is the res appropriate response to the trends we've seen up until now. And of course, this is accelerated, but a lot of the same trends hold. Um, and so hoping I will be able to share a little bit in this yeah, podcast. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I feel for you because you put together this amazing report, The Jobs Landscape in 2022, uh, which came out at the start of the year. And um, I'm sure some things are still aligned, but it's, you know, everything's kind of um, been turned on its head slightly as well. Yes, certainly. But I, I think some trends will rebound, uh, mm -hmm. but we're definitely tracking this with a lot of our new metrics partners uh, like LinkedIn, like Coursera, and we can see how the adaptation is happening live in more granularity than ever before, really. Fantastic. And uh, Richard? Hi there. Um, so I work with UFI Ventures and we invest in companies that develop digital technologies to give people and businesses the skills needed for work now and in the future. Um, and, 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 and similar to Vessi, we, we, we produced an investment thesis uh, literally before the lockdown, uh, which was focused around this space, um, probably available on some of the links that you'll be providing. Um, and I, I, think, I think in summary, it, it's, for me, it's, if we ignore the, kind of the social element to, to the pandemic and just focus around sort of the economic side, um, you know, from an investor perspective and from a, a sort of a technology perspective, you know, th this living laboratory of speed that has been created because of the, 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 the rules and regulations that come out around the pandemic is, you, know, you want to almost say that actually uh, it's things that technology companies would wish for. But I think it's even too fast for that from that perspective mm -hmm. and, and just seeing what's actually happening and seeing, you know, how, you know, really quite capable businesses have been in actually adapting as fast as they possibly can. Um, but I think, you know, even from a, um, sort of a, a learning technologies perspective, that, you know, the real impact is not going to sort of really surface until sort of next year when we start going from, you know, massive reaction to uh, ever changing regulations to actually something more meaningful. But uh, I certainly think you know, significant areas of both uh, Bessie's work and, and our work have, have changed permanently. Um, but I also agree with her. I think, you know, certainly some of the thematic areas of that doesn't change it's just maybe how they come forward is 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 where the change is going to occur but it's, it's interesting because um i know before this uh call we all kind of uh took some time to read uh, a world economic forum article which was titled the future of work is here five ways to reset labor markets after coronavirus recovery um and just for the listeners a few of the main points so the coronavirus crisis has hurried the arrival of the future of work um, and there is an opportunity to build back better in five areas. So some of those are reskilling and upskilling, um, supporting the jobs of tomorrow, re-evaluating what is essential work, 
um, and resetting education skills and job systems. So, I mean, it's very early days, I suppose, but from everyone on the call, what, what's your sense of, um, you know, this idea of building back better? Um, because like Gordon said, I think there's been different phases and I've sort of gone through the optimistic phase and I wrote a blog about, you know, with seeing Parliament use digital and then obviously um, some of these things are being rolled back. So it's not a kind of linear process of, of progress, as it were. So I just wondered from all of your work and the, 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 the kind of um, strange times we've had, where you've seen things being built back better and, and what you'd like to see more of as well. So, so from my perspective in smaller, high growth businesses, I think the once people have got out of the reaction mode in the first few weeks, we started to see that a lot of the successful CEOs, in, interestingly, one of the things that we'd evaluated before of looking at what makes a successful CEO of a high growth business is this natural desire and hunger for their own personal development. I think mm-hmm period has given those people once they've gone out of the reactionary stage the time to reflect of looking that across their team and look at more creative ways of um, reskilling, upskilling and developing their people and um, so it's always something that's been talked around but I think that a lot of people have looked at more traditional classroom workshop based things which you know, even before all of this, companies were running at a million miles an hour, didn't have the time, they were usually under-resourced, didn't have the time to send people on to long courses and whatever. So I think that that has given a lot of CEOs and a lot of executives the time to evaluate different solutions that are available on the market, mm-hmm. people doing more of that. What I've seen in my own team, which has been really interesting, and we one of our hiring criteria is an appetite for personal development and learning. But during this time, even though we've been incredibly busy, my team have also been going out and looking and finding things for themselves with mixed results in terms of what they've found on the market, but have actually come back to us and saying, can we do that? And can we do this? And different different areas of their own development they probably wouldn't have considered themselves. So they've reflected in their own career paths as well which has been really quite interesting. But the challenge we found is just a mixed bag of what is available. Um, and some of the things have been great. Some of the things have been particularly poor. Um, and so the challenge is now, that, and there's a lot of companies who've jumped onto this who are developing solutions with, again, mixed results. So it's hmm. been able to find out what's really good. Yeah. No comparison site for... Um, vocational learning where you can have you know who's who's doing good stuff and who's doing bad stuff at the moment or haven't found one anyway this comment from gordon was interesting as later on everyone started to discuss the need for a comparison site for for vocational learning technology specifically here's how the chat went down you know that that is a bit of a challenge um because how, how do you put a market, you know, what, what are the values of the marketplace in order for you to create? And therefore, um, you know, you've got, you've got the kind of the technology marketplaces, you know, with Apple, iOS, Windows, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, is it just one place where everything goes or is it, is it curated? Because I think one of the things that, you know, the biggest thing around learning is, is it any good or not? And does it do what I need it to do? And there are so many different perspectives that sit around that. It makes a really complicated, you know, what seems like a, a simple idea, you know, is, um, oh, oh, right, so there's this brilliant course that does leadership, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's driven in a very academic way um, based out of university, which means if you're more vocationally minded, you might not engage with it. And so you'll have people that actually think it's crap. So... You know, I, I think there's a, there's a huge challenge that sits around actually creating some something like that, um, and I think it's one of those reasons why technology has not disrupted the education market as quickly as it has done many other markets. And I think you know, sort of, you know, I, I know I keep going back to this, Sophie, but yeah, both health and education are two areas that haven't been massively disrupted by technology because ultimately the the failure impact is quite significant, right? If you get a tech wrong in school or if you get a health tech wrong, someone could die, you know, whereas if you're looking at booking a holiday or if you're looking at you know, certain things, you know, it might be irritating and frustrating, but there isn't a kind of like a, a real 
impact from that perspective. And if I, but you know, it's a challenge that needs to be stepped up to, right? Um, and now I think there's so many more people that are aware of this space and the need for learning. And actually, how do you integrate technology to accelerate that and actually enhance it as a, as a product or, or as a sort of an area? Um, I think is only good, but I think, you know, I don't think there's a quick fix by turning around and saying, right, okay, well, that one, that one, and that one, and therefore, you know, you, you solved that problem. So I think it's a an, an good idea in principle, but I, I'm not sure how that actually gets properly executed. And who would be the trust authority of, 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 of making those recommendations, right? I agree with Richard. I think it's it's been a challenge that to actually identify what that definitive list would be. But I do think for those who actually just want some solutions, um, I mean, it's still, there's still a dimension of kind of ways to look for what works, um, even if there is no definitive list. Uh, so one is um, if you're thinking about retraining, thinking about um, where growth is going to be in the labor market and in your la local labor market, because we can talk all we want about global trends, but there is a question about uh, where you're willing to move to, what job opportunities are around, uh, what can you actually target. And then the other piece is uh, actually doing your research and seeing what qualifications other people in that labor market have actually gained, what might have been helpful to them. Um, and being quite targeted. I think there's something there around um, doing the groundwork. It's not as easy as picking up a catalog and saying, I'll do this, mm. and it will definitely get me to this job. Um, but um, in the current environment where we have quite a fragmented set of qualifications out there that vary by country, that vary by local area sometimes, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of this that is back on the person who's trying to kind of find their next step to, to do the research, unfortunately. But if there's a way to do it, it is that. It is to say, okay, first of all, what is growing? Second of all, uh, what qualifications are respected by the professionals where this is growing? And um, yeah, that's, that's as close to this one that I can think of. For those interested in building a useful comparison site, UFI Voctech Trust are building a community to see if this could benefit from funding support. You can search for UFI Voctech Essentials to find out more. Now, back to our chat. Veselini kicks off with three major impacts of COVID-19 on workplace learning and skills development. Yeah, um, I think it, a lot of this resonates, but maybe there are three three things that really we've seen that are quite major. Um, one is that the the kind of worker learner that you have has bifurcated into two camps. Um, one camp are those who are still employed and who are having to suddenly change their way of work quite significantly. And we know that a lot of organizations had set out on a digitization journey um, and had provided some, but not a lot of reskilling uh, associated with that for all staff. Uh, but now this is a reality that everybody has to live with. And that has created a lot of uh, well-being challenges mm. for workers who then suddenly have to upskill, sometimes with support, sometimes without support. On the other hand, we do have a lot of workers who are suddenly either um, on furlough or unemployed. And whilst we thought for some time that workers might be able to transition from their current jobs that are maybe being displayed by, displaced by, by technologies onto new jobs that are growing, uh, I mean, this is uh, putting a bit of a spindle in that theory in that we think that now we might see more workers who be, um, I, have, I guess, have more close relationship to the state than to an mm. employer and might be out of work when they have to reskill. So that does change the focus of investment quite significantly. Um, and then in terms of the actual technologies that we could use, there is a bit of a gap in content that we all know about. And the report that you mentioned, Emily, at the beginning, this Jobs of Tomorrow report that we published uh, during our annual meeting in Davos, 
tries to actually speak to that because what we did is worked with LinkedIn, Burning Glass Technologies, Coursera, to really look at the growing jobs and associated skills to those growing jobs on a global scale and think about what kind of content we might need Mm -hmm. uh, to reskill people into. Uh, And there is a lot of uncertainty on this. That is one of the major areas of support that uh, employers need help with. And that is maybe a disconnect as well sometimes between uh, the education technology providers and employers. What is the actual gap we're trying to fill? Uh, what are, what are we reskilling people into? Uh, are these genuinely growing jobs? Will this give people the opportunity for future employment um, that is resilient to change? Uh, so that's something quite important. And then I think the final piece that maybe is worth not forgetting is the the aspect of inclusion, and that that speaks a little bit more to the design principles of the technologies that we're putting at scale. Um, And we are actually launching um, a toolkit on diversity and inclusion in a few weeks, co-convened with uh, a lot of CDIOs, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officers across different spheres. And as we discussed some of the dangers of technologies, we actually touched a lot on the fact that technologies are not necessarily neutral with respect to inclusion. We know that, for example, tech jobs are heavily male. And one of the reasons they're heavily male is the initial psychometrics and measurements used to recruit into those tech jobs were biased towards those with formal degree qualifications in mathematics at the time. And those were primarily men. And now, as we're trying to create a better world and build that back better, we also need to think a little bit more about uh, the kind of procurement criteria, so to say. And it sounds very dry, but the outcomes are less than dry. So have all the tools been tested uh, for biases mm. against different groups? Are they truly inclusive? Are they easy to use? Who's going to be using them? Um, so that's also a kind of a third important area. Yes, yeah, super interesting. I know I got here that, with your report at the start of the year, um, in purely quantitative terms, 75 million current job roles may be displaced by the shift in the division of labour between humans, machines and algorithms, whilst 133 million new jobs may emerge at the same time. So that might now, by the sounds of it, the the government, the state may have more of a role in, uh, you know, where where some of that displacement or support or new jobs come in. Yes, and overall, a lot of people have made predictions about what are likely to be uh, the major shifts around the future of jobs. Is there going to be more growth or less growth? Uh, Is it going to be a net positive in the long term? A lot of predictions are net positive, but there's a time issue, right? Uh, A worker being out of work Mm. for six months or a year is a significant impact on somebody's life. Um, So it raises a lot of questions around um, transitions and how do we make these transitions um, good and healthy and positive for people? And before this happened, in many ways, we were a bit worried that we are going to have to incentivize motivation in much larger ways. That's one thing that we don't have to worry about as much. People are motivated to work for the most part. Um, so we actually just need to meet the demand for reskilling uh, into new jobs that will grow eventually, even if not immediately. And I think there is a de- definite worry there that the economic circumstance and potentially a recession is going to slow down when that growth comes. But uh, most reskilling requires time. So now is actually the time to start planning for uh, the content and reskilling of that, uh, those jobs. You know, just uh, I was actually doing. Uh, I was actually listening to some of the COGX stuff that was that's been on this week, and and there was a uh, uh, something with uh, Steve O'Hare from TechCrunch and Nicholas Zenstrom from uh, Atomico, who was also, I believe, the founder of Skype. Um, and and he was he was saying that um, you know in the first month or so of, of lockdown, everyone was thinking, oh look, we can run our entire lives on Zoom. Um, 
and then now they're going well hang on a minute um so we just need to uh, um, maybe reassess this and actually i know gordon and i have had a previous conversation where actually we are looking forward to uh, sort of a bit of human contact and actually getting out and seeing people and i think that's the reality that we need to to, to sort of you know focus back on is that um you know life is about human to human interaction and it's about how does technology enable that and actually enhance some of that and certainly in certain situations where there's a need for us to behave in a certain way technology can actually um, uh, help with that as well um i think certainly social care is one of those real you know big areas where actually um you know throughout all of this there has still been a need for people to um support other people and in a very intimate way and um you know you can't you know you can't do that via zoom uh, and so working out how society deals with these type of uh, um kind of uh, pandemics is is something you know that's a big big long challenge and um, i think from a learning tech perspective and investment perspective i think we're kind of sitting in a bit of a full storm at the moment where um um you know we're on, we're kind of coming out of lockdown but the state is is effectively underwriting a lot of jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm not sure we're going to really understand where uh, where this all lies um, in you know, September October time. That's going to be quite uh, quite interesting. But equally, you know, three months of the lockdown in, in theory, you know, in, in behaviour habits, three months uh, forms a habit, right? So I'm guessing a lot of the stuff that uh, has been implemented that is working is actually just it's, it's going to stay anyway. So I think there will be rollback in certain areas, but I'm not sure it's going to be uh, you know sort of across the board. I think it's really interesting what um, we were talking about earlier, though, of my world is 100% employment. You know, it's, it's the growing companies which got investment, quite a lot of our clients haven't taken, um, put people on furlough or let people go. I hadn't really considered the concept of, um, you know, that actually there's going to be a change, isn't there? There will be a lot of people who will now need to, reskill and upskill whilst not employed as opposed to whilst employed that i hadn't considered because i'm in a bit of a bubble at the moment of yeah companies that are growing, and i hadn't really considered that and i think it's very easy when you're in a job and when you're employed to think about your own personal development and know where to go and get it you go to your hr department you go to your manager you go to your boss whatever get mm. access to that training and um, and you've got resources to be able to deliver that as well. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens and how that is supported for people who aren't in employment and who do need to get that reskilling. So that's going to be an interesting space to watch in the coming months. I think. I think there's there's a real you know this is a real opportunity for um, um, the public and private sectors to actually work together. You know, I remember back in two thousand when I was. Um, working with a regional development agency and, and there were a lot of technology jobs that were uh, were, were cut and there was um, you know how do you actually help um, and a, a term that I've heard recently is is offboarding so actually how do you take staff that are going to be leaving an organization for you know whatever reason but actually how do how does the organization do that in a positive way but equally how does the state then pick it up or, or the employment market pick it up and actually how do you ensure that those individuals are, based on their capabilities, undertaking either the right job applications or taking undertaking the right um, upskilling or reskilling activity? So, it's, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a fascinating, uh, fascinating time, and, and whether you know the, sort of the public sector can can keep in step and, and up to speed with the uh, with the private sector needs, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be quite a challenge. It's interesting you say about offboard, Richard. Uh, my first company I worked for we bought a company that um, did they called it outplacement at the time and it's really difficult when someone's been made redundant to say to them we'll give you a package around upskilling and personal development what they actually rather have is cash so those my old companies would I think I can't remember what they used to charge I didn't work in that side of the business but every single person I spoke to was like I've just lost my job can I just not have that as cash because I don't know what's going to happen in the next six it's um Again, it's as we was talking about earlier of um, that transition period. Six months of unemployment is a long, long time. Mm. So motivating somebody to take a retraining package as opposed to the cash alternative at the day that you've been made redundant, I think is going to be a big challenge as well. Because yes. 
Yeah, and, and, I, I, think, and I think ultimately it can't be uh, either or, right? Because mm. people are going to want to make sure they can cover their mortgage for a few months, right? Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, Vessie. No worries. Um, I think the the big kind of bad question is, do we ever think that public sector institutions would be able to do this themselves and really have a, a good enough sense of what is needed in the labor market. I mean, it's different by country, right? Um, so we've been speaking a lot with uh, the folks over in Singapore who have an infamously excellent system for mapping their labor market. Now, the qu- scale is different, uh, but that does exist. Um, in France, uh, they have developed a kind of state-sponsored reskilling passport, more called formation, I think it is. Um, so there, there is very different capability by government. Uh, and the UK is a bit of a special case here because of the amount of people who are on furlough. And I don't think we've yet published unemployment figures. Uh, other countries have. And so you can actually see uh, the, the challenges ahead. Uh, so if people are on furlough, that does mean that you, you don't look like you have a lot of unemployment, maybe, uh, but that doesn't mean those jobs are coming back. And I think that's definitely a risk factor specifically for the UK, uh, which has taken this uh, route. But overall, you know, public institutions should have some sort of role in knowing what is um, the growing end of the private sector and what reskilling should be provided. But let's face it, most people going to an unemployment office are, are not having a positive experience. Mm. They're, they're not seeing this as something that's enriching, that's going to help them get to where they're heading next. Um, and fundamentally, if we're really making a big bet, that should change. Uh, now, is it on track to changing? I'm not sure. I mean, the UK specifically has also defunded its labor market forecasting quite significantly uh, for a few years, I think. But some institutions are doing good work. So Nesta has been doing good work, actually, with some of the same data partners that we've used for our work, uh, like Burning Glass Technologies, trying to understand what's growing, what's shrinking. But the capacity just isn't currently there. Um, what some private sector companies have been doing is also specifically pitching to governments to address the, the workforce uh, challenges that they're facing. So we know that Corsair has been working now with a number of governments uh, to try and uh, provide programs specifically for workers who are significantly affected. But that's one company, right? And uh, so there is a big gap there that is still very glaring. And I think it's also more than functional skills as well, isn't it? It's not just reskilling in terms of the function of what that person's going to do. There's also things about the modern way of working, communication skills, social skills, attitude and attitude, showing people how to demonstrate that. You know, 80% of people are, lose their jobs because of attitude and, and the way they work, not because of their functional skill set. So if people can learn that side of things and learn how to learn or diagnose how they learn. I think I was talking to a, a guy yesterday, he's a venture capitalist, and we're talking about this hunger to learn. And I was saying, I read a lot. And he, he said, well, I don't because I'm dyslexic. And, you know, if, but, but often people don't know how they learn either. So therefore, when they go into an unemployment office and it's very one way and very linear, this is the stuff, that's why they come away with a bad experience of, it doesn't adapt to the individual where again in a working environment and in a business, because you know, you're particularly in a small business where we operate managers know their teams a lot more intimately and therefore they will adapt the training specifically to the individual. So I think there's also a, an element of having a form of adaptability into that as well, not just one way of doing things. Yeah, I, I, I agree on that. I, um, we are actually seeing uh, sort of the emergence of some interesting uh, uh, companies that are looking at actually, okay, well, if people aren't read, can they listen? And if they're going to, you know, so actually how do you develop learning resources that are um, better delivered through uh, an audio? You know, you're absolutely right. I think the, from, from, from our investment perspective, I think the positivity is the fact that actually the entire, there is the market are now more aware of the type of solutions that are available and therefore 
um, hopefully we'll, we'll see more uh, demand in, in areas in which we'll actually you know, properly demonstrate value. I think one of the, the challenges of early stage technology in the market is actually getting that product market fit and actually the, you know, the customer demand. Um, and I think we're going to see over the next sort of 12 months that, um, you know, the procurers are, are more intelligent in this space and are able to actually, um, you know, buy what they're looking for rather than actually it being a little bit of a, something they need to look at at some point, but actually they just need to get those training courses delivered in that physical place, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's also a need to engage businesses in that as well, because most of us learn a lot via experience. Yeah. And if you're in an employed environment, you get that because you can go and sit at someone else's, we well, can't now, so this is in, but you can go and listen to how other people work or get involved in other people's projects. When you're not in employment, that's very difficult. I think um, when I, I do some work with founders for schools and it's around bringing children into the working environment to learn different things that they wouldn't see within um, the normal work placements that they might get. Um, I think getting some kind of partnership with businesses to get people in to help with the reskilling mm -hmm. in an experience type environment. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, I sit with a number of accelerators and um, innovation centers, and I'm certainly going to take away from today that we should look at um, how you can engage not just companies coming into those programs, but individuals or groups of people coming in for the peer to peer piece. Um, because I think, again, if you're at home and unemployed, that's going to be very difficult to get that experience. And particularly if a lot of this is going to be via technology and online, bringing the peer to peer. And, the, and as you said, Richard, the, the thing is making a blend of the real world and the virtual world coming together. Um, I think that that's something that's got to be looked at somewhere. And Gordon, have you um, got a sense of the companies that you work with, the, the types of technologies they've used over the last three, four months to sort of cope with the transition? Um, to some degree, the phrase I hear a lot is death by webinar. Um, so, you know, there's a uh, lot yeah. of things of just people sitting on screens. And then we've been looking at um, what are the more creative ways there are of doing that. Um, I went on a... Barclays have done a back to business program at Cambridge University. That was quite interesting. There were some interactive sessions, there was, um, some webinar sessions, and then the exercises that you took away and did offline. Um, we're doing a program with a company at the moment, and part of this has been instead of doing half day sessions, we've been breaking it into smaller sessions of um, and then small sessions of online training, then some work groups that they will take offline and do on their own. Um, and then bringing back the answers. So trying to have it a little bit less, um, a little bit less of just pure screen time. Because one of the things that we're all seeing a lot of is um, we're on screen a lot more. Richard and I were talking about this the other week. Um, you know, the amount of video calls that we have is actually exhausting, and I think it's quite difficult for people to do. But I haven't seen anything specific in terms of what people are using. But it seems to be a desire to have a more varied. Um, learning platform than just webinars and essentially lectures and, and again people are trying to find ways of getting the peer-to-peer -peer piece in there the networking piece in there um, as part of their learning. Yeah, I'm so glad that um, you mentioned uh, trying to find more creative ways than webinars and video conferencing because I, I completely agree um, and one thing that I think was quite interesting in, in this time is you know we, we've seen institutions who are you know known for their bureaucracy suddenly uh, uh, sort of um, have much more agile processes and I think the same thing with um, sort of needing to turn around training as people shift jobs or you know I'm thinking specifically within the NHS as they sort of shifted people's roles or adapted um, to new ways of working I mean that that's quite encouraging I suppose. I think it, I think it's yeah I think it is an interesting time you know just picking up on you know, what Gordon was saying I think um you know, getting businesses and education establishments together around this sort of uh, challenge area is 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 key. You know, the technologies are actually out there. I, I think I think the the sort of the battleground now for early stage technology businesses that sit in this space is you know, are they commercially sound? Are they uh, you know, can they actually go and run a business in this space that actually delivers these services? Because you know, I think people are being exp ex experimenting with technology, um, you know, quite a lot. 
And then I think on the flip side, you know, you look at certain organisations, you know, we could take um, the British Business Bank or, um, you know, some of the loan schemes and that sort of thing. And suddenly, you know, what used to take three to six months has now been executed in three to six weeks. Um, and, you know, when it's a question of getting money out or that sort of thing and, you know, other grant institutions like Innovate and that type of thing, you know, well, okay, so they've just proved that it doesn't have to take as long as it does previously. Do they go back to the old business model? Um, and there's some argument that actually, if you're making investments, that actually that time is on, you know, time is good for both people. Um, or do you try and, and stick and, and, you know, try and rapidly deploy? It? And you know, I think, I think it does fundamentally provide some interesting inflection points that once, once we're kind of like, you know, fully operational again about actually how, how do businesses, organizations and services actually, uh, actually deliver going forward? I think one of the interesting uh, pieces of tech that I've heard about is maybe at the intersection of hiring and ed tech, because there is a piece around, so what if you've received, um, you've been at the recipient end of a, of a course, uh, you know, is anybody going to count that credential as uh, valuable for getting uh, a new role or a promotion or doing different kinds of projects? So a lot of what we've been talking about uh, with different partners has been how do you make the credentials you receive um, as uh, when doing an education technology course legitimate um, and yeah. valid. So some organizations have already started experimenting, uh, experimenting with pre-qualifying learners uh, for uh, jobs. So that's happened as an experiment in the U.S. with veterans in some cases, in some cases just community college graduates where if you've, uh, if you've got some credentials in your kind of digital credential passport, you're already past the first stage of hiring. I think that's actually quite important uh, for raising the legitimacy of the whole education technology sector. And there is some segmentation by different kinds of skills. Um, and uh, there's some very interesting experiments in definitely having a kind of a soft skills platform. So we, we speak with um, a company called Plymetrics who does this, but there are others who actually do this on the assessment side within hiring. So there's actually a broader ecosystem than just the immediate uh, kind of qualification or skills givers uh, technologies, but there's that the bigger connection through to, do we have a, a kind of a skills passport for an individual? Um, does that matter for them getting hired? Is it still the same people that are going to get hired, promoted, or transitioned internally on the basis of uh, qualifications that maybe matter more? And how do we actually raise the, the prominence and prestige of, of these digital qualifications? And, and I think that's, I think that I agree. I think that's hugely important because going back to that kind of now cliched stat of 80% of people hired on function and next and qualifications are fired because of attitude then mm -hmm. having people you know with traditional qualifications etc is that the way forward moving outwards but the challenge is how do you how do you match those together to how do you get people to publicize what it is they're really looking for in a hiring decision and then you can match the training to do that so encouraging employers to do that alongside training organizations i think is really an interesting match um, we certainly do that in, when we're looking at um hiring people into our clients we'll build together a hiring matrix which incorporates all the areas that we want to bring in for business um, and then we'll align that to it isn't the training passport but we'll see what commitment people have had to their own personal development along the way and, and beyond just going to school university and getting a degree we'll look beyond that of what other, th other things that people have done which may be a lot less formal and a lot less qualified but people have sent themselves or been put onto communications courses or whatever it may be we uh, we look around all of those pieces i think i think that is absolutely critical. I think yeah, certainly the creden you know um, the credentialing element I think is really interesting, and that and that actually is you know, that's almost like a technology. And, and you know, do you look at blockchain, uh, the digital badges, and that sort of thing? We, we you know, UFI have over the years done a number of uh, kind of um, either grants um, 
uh, or investments in, in this space. And I think it, what it does do is it actually proves that actually getting micro credentialing right really does work. And there's been some experiments with with you know in big industrial players and and colleges where actually they get to input into the type of training that is actually done, and then the throughput into in, in, into the jobs market is is you know incredibly high, you know, and the transition rate is incredibly high around that sort of thing. I think we're at the next step where we're actually okay. So how does this scale on a on, on a large uh, larger perspective? You know, sixty four million people in the UK. You know, the global numbers. I guess this is where certain countries have a, a bit of an advantage. Like uh, uh, let's you talk about Singapore. You know, that the, they've got a very condensed uh, space and population, which they can actually do it. And, same with the Nordics as well, um, but I, I do think it is something that that does need to be uh, getting a grip of because as you start moving to more digitally enabled training, actually, does that training provide value? And therefore, is, if people are going to invest either their time and their money, or just their time, or whether governments are going to invest money into some of these things, yeah, you know, they have to add value. They have to get somebody somewhere, right? Otherwise, it just it just lets everyone down and then there's a bigger challenge that sits in the marketplace as well um so i'd be really if anyone's got any examples of where where this is scaling i think it, um you know, i'd be very interested to, to look at those yeah well i know that there's some talks centered at the u.s chamber of commerce um but in collaboration with a lot of data companies to make it more clear what different jobs are hiring for but then the connection through to education technology providers is something that's not always there. Um, we have been looking at this um, as the World Economic Forum, and we actually are hosting a whole range of um, activities to try and unlock this as far as we can incentivize this to happen. Um, and the cost of not getting this right is actually quite well documented. So I don't know if you've, um, you've had a chance to read a book called Boom Bust Exodus. It's actually it's an excellent um, kind of review of what happened when uh, some of the um, Midwestern firms in the US went away and then the government tried to have a workforce uh, redeployment strategy, really, and they trained people right um, in a very analog way. But the jobs weren't necessarily available at the end of that training. so. This is quite well documented by a local research project that then was able to uh, to track this. And the result is that people invested in their reskilling, but there was no realization of that investment in terms of any returns um, in improvement of quality of life. So if you then think of the impact on believing in lifelong learning as something beyond the nice to have, as something that actually gets you somewhere, that's huge. Um, and there is a sense that if, if you do ask people to take the time out to change their skills, sometimes in significant ways, there has to be a win at the other end, right? There has to be something that they get out of it. Um, otherwise, it goes a little bit in a direction. It's like a flower arranging course or a history course. Uh, it, it teaches you something fun, but you don't think of it as essential and important. Um, and that's really a, a gap to fill. What I was saying at the beginning as well is you know, if you look at really successful entrepreneurs, they are constantly that lifelong long learning piece. So, so you can see that within people who've built businesses that have been successful, they do that. So you would imagine that does roll out across whoever you are if, you're, if you have access to and, and commit to the constant program of development, then of course it is going to get engaged. And of course things that you learned five years ago or 10 years ago or for my degree 20 years ago are completely and utterly out of date. So if you're not constantly, if you haven't got constant access to development and training, then of course you're going to fall behind anyway, regardless of the, the current speed that the world's evolving anyway. So one of the areas that I've been sort of looking at recently is is the um, sort of the financing of learning. Um, and, and obviously that there's three areas that that can come with, which is, um, either the state, uh, companies, or, or kind of the individual. Um, is there an issue here? And, and Vesti, I was wondering, you know, with what you've been sort of talking about with, with what went on over in, uh, in the state, you know, is, is liquidity in this space actually a barrier? Um, or is it more a question of actually just being able to understand the value of either doing, uh, of doing 
learning um, needs to be improved because the money's there. It's just people need to be convinced to put 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 it in the space. Well, we did some modelling a couple of years ago in collaboration with BCG. Just put a few figures to um, how much does it pay back to businesses and to governments, not necessarily just to sole individuals. Mm. And realistically, if you think of the cost to a government of having somebody out of work and the social security payments and other associated costs that you experience as the public sector, it actually makes a phenomenal amount of sense to reskill people if you're a government. For businesses, there's also a value add there because if you think of a very tight labor market where people who have uh, sought after after skills, which we've mentioned, they include data uh, and AI, but also they actually include new kinds of marketing. They include content production. They include product development. They include people and culture skills, um, so HR skills. Um, when you think of a tight labor market where you might have a shortage of a set of skills in the market, you're paying a premium for hiring workers. When you reskill everybody, it gets to be less more less a case of polarization and one set of your workers are getting very high wages and another set of your workers are not necessarily getting those dividends. Uh, you kind of even that out a little bit as a curve within your own enterprise because there's a lot less a culture of scarcity. But it's not the same level of returns to some businesses, right? And it's not the same for all worker types. Um, in terms of individuals, I mean, I think people are quite resilient. But, you know, obviously, if you're a household with very few means, there is a barrier to this. Um, so we do need to look at the institutions that can help people along the way. One question I had, sorry, um, my, my baby has calmed down now and he's making all, all sorts of noises that you wouldn't want on a podcast episode. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, one question I had was just before we go, um, you know, what's the likelihood, do you think, of a kind of long term shift to remote working uh, and flexible working practices? Because I think in the beginning, again, I, I was kind of fairly optimistic about this as someone who enjoys the benefits of that myself. But then... I think almost the the wheels of are starting to fall off uh you know some of the re- remote working without that communication training that you mentioned Gordon so you know perhaps it is harder to resolve conflict or work in teams sometimes so I just wondered where you see companies may give up their offices and shift to remote working where it might be more hybrid um and and the, some of the conversations you're having around that issue <laughs> there we go hello <laughs> I think um, I, I, so. So this this is just just gut instinct, <laughs> but uh, I think we'll see a shift away from kind of like you know absolutely huge offices. I think we'll start seeing more of distributed working. So actually building resilience into the business by having people in different geographical locations. Um, I think the one fundamental thing that doesn't get picked up when everyone talks about real remote working is actually. Um, the individual having the capacity in in their domestic life to actually accommodate that it, you know on a temporary basis i think a lot of people can but actually on a more permanent basis actually is there the space that they actually want to give up the space uh, there's a whole bunch of potential uh, you know um, taxation uh, implications that actually sit around it um, i think at the very nature we are humans right and and humans interact with humans um, i i think it's more of a challenge shall we say with vertical cities so you know when there, when there's a real intense population and very small amounts of space um you know places like bristol which have very few high rises um you look at the kind of like the spread of the pandemic and that sort of thing and actually the buffer on bristol hasn't been too bad so whether that's something to do with it but um i think you know technology is great and remote working is great but i think ultimately we are humans and, and we're going to you know we're going to settle on something that actually humans like to do i think that's the thing isn't it i think i agree with you richard but it depends on a whole bunch of different things not least age so we have a number of young workers who are desperate to get back because they're in um 
house shares and flats and um, past everything. I've got other people who work are delighted about working from home. We've never had a working from home policy before, so they're finding it useful. So I think the likelihood is um, it will be a high hybrid market. We're seeing that from a lot of our clients as well, is that they've not really considered home working before, but this has proven to them that actually the level of flexibility will work um, I think that the thing that looking outward that I think is going to be challenging of the coming months as we come out of lockdown is um, we're seeing really smart businesses that are going to ease their people back into an office environment we're seeing other cl other companies who are not our clients but are saying as soon as the doors are open everyone's going back to work and I do worry about the social implications of that of anxiety of people who are feeling vulnerable right now about coronavirus as a whole but then are going to go into a working environment having been at home 12 at, for 12 weeks sitting next to somebody that they might not like because they don't love their job who might be ill and they might pick something up and if they're just thrown back into that environment without any social support or well-being support i think that's going to be a really tricky place to be and I'm talking to a lot of ceos and founders of businesses who are dedicating a lot of time and thought into that um but i'm also hearing a lot of companies who are not putting any thought into that and are just thinking right okay this is it let's go and i had to go and actually i went to see a client a few weeks ago because they were key workers and it was even for for me who you know i love going out meeting people in the business environment i still found it a bit unnerving after being under lockdown for eight weeks to go into an office and to see it be different and to be around other people in a working environment whilst this is all going on. So I think um, thought needs to be put into that by employers of how are their people going to adapt from having either been furloughed to going back into an office environment or having been working from home to go back into an office environment. Because a client I went to see, they never did the working from home thing. They produced the diagnostic tool um, and therefore, and it's valid in the coronavirus environment, and therefore have um, stayed. They've, they've gone from kind of phase one of the not the pre-lockdown working to phase three of the the new world of social distancing at work directly. So it was natural behaviours for them to go and do it. Even walking into my office today, seeing all the stickers on the wall and seeing the sanitizers and seeing all the one-way system to come in and out of the office is all very bizarre and I think there's going to need to be a transition to help people get through that when they come back to, to a working environment. I think I would second that um, with the additional detail that um, so we've been speaking to a lot of chief human resources officers in global companies including some that operate in China and have seen the for, for the full cycle of um, full lockdown to emergence and the room reading of that the sense very much in the room there is that the the open office as we know it is unlikely to survive not only because of this particular context but because obviously a lot of managerial literature has already proven that it's not a very productive place to work so a lot of employers are looking at redesigning the way they use space with potentially some level of remote work being consistently something that is available to people. Um, if we look at the figures of who, which industries used remote work as a, a kind of a working practice in a way, it is very asymmetric. I mean, um, we have the tech industry where maybe 74% of companies um, were, had this sort of arrangement as uh, the norm uh, to obviously industries which are in-person industries where this is less possible and others who are not who don't need the in-person contact but nevertheless did not go um, into the remote working practice as much as uh, IT for example and in those industries where remote working was already the norm there are actually skills to managing distributing teams and there are skills to connecting to colleagues as uh, things like async communication are big and there is a manual to how to do this well and for me i think the challenge is more that we're trying to do this without the associated leadership and managerial skills 
being provided to us. Um, and in some cases, we're not realizing that those skills are needed. So there's a little bit of exchange that needs to happen on how both the physical adjustments to the way that employees use space are made, but also the actual reskilling of managers and leaders to lead distributed workforces. Because there are benefits to, to having some sort of remote arrangement, um, reducing city density, giving opportunity to more people in different locations uh, than those who relocated to major cities. Um, so it's yet to be seen, but I think there's even a reskilling dimension to this one. I don't think we've covered it much, and maybe this is for our next conversation, but I think the thing you say, Vessi, uh, around leadership is important, but I think also, Gordon, the, the, the whole psychological impact of what we've just experienced over the last three months, so sort of the mental health and well-being, both of people who are returning to work and having to be um, physically closer to uh, the people that aren't their family, but also the, psych- uh, the, the sort of the mental health implications of um, mass job redundancies etc that may come our way you know september october november that type of thing um i think that you know th- those are a couple of areas that um we haven't given any focus to but actually are going to be you know, quite significant over uh, the remainder of the year and into next year yeah there's actually been some really interesting work there from the what works for well-being uh, excellence center who started publishing more on how to support workers with well-being um, and that's okay. very positive. So we, we are seeing a lot of um, well, the well-being thing has massively jumped, accelerated probably. We were talking about well-being at work years ago and some people got it 10, 12 weeks ago. Everyone seems to have got it. But again, it's a bit like the education piece. It's um, sorting out what's good and what's not. And so uh-huh. there's a lot of people jumped onto that bandwagon, but it is a serious consideration and something that again you can see we're seeing two camps of employers as those who have really grasped it and really talked about it for for months and are really jumping all over it and then seeing other people who are at the other end of the spectrum who still aren't really haven't hit their radar yet um i think with mass unemployment around the corner which is likely it is something that's going to be a stress point for the country i think And there we have it, another episode. That's all for this week. Thanks so much for listening in and sending your listener voicemails in. UFI Voctec Trust for supporting and Richard, Vessi and Gordon for being this week's guests. For further reading around this week's chat, go to theedtechpodcast.com where we list out all the resources mentioned by our guests. And we'll be doing more of these Build Back Better episodes, so look out for those coming soon. Great, thanks Sophie. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you both. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Bessie. Speak soon. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.